Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session on Cyber Resilient Digital Transformation. Let me say a few words of introducing myself. My name is Arun George. I'm the regional account executive covering Middle East and Africa region from OpenTech Cybersecurity. I've got more than 20 years of experience in the field of cyber security spanning across uh, IT, uh, OT, and IoT. I've been fortunate to work in various areas of cybersecurity like in the pre-sales, in the consulting, and now finally in the technology sales. So let's look into the topic which we have in hand, which is all about how to make digital transformation cyber resilient. Now, the name digital transformation, I know it's familiar to all of you. In simple words, it is that processes or technologies which help an organization to deliver its business. IT is just a business enabler. So whatever processes and technologies we, the organization puts into their uh, core by which things can move in a faster manner and in a simpler manner. Examples like for a B2B customer or a B2C customer onboarding a new client, how easy it is, how much we can avoid the paperwork involved, how much of this information, uh, the uh, information in this process can be done just over the internet using a laptop or using a mobile phone. So it can be a desktop application, it can be a web application, it can be a mobile application. All these what we use to make sure that the process is becoming very simpler and much faster. Now, just about digital transformation, something which comes into my mind is just after the COVID, there was a forward, I'm sure all of you might have received it over a WhatsApp message or Facebook. It was a question like this, what enabled or who enabled digital transformation? It was a multiple choice question and the choices were CEO, CIO, CTO, and the last one being COVID. And you know what the result is, right? Naturally, the majority or the maximum or all of the votes went to COVID. Yeah, it's true. COVID actually made sure that those organizations which were hesitant to move towards uh, digital transformation or to accept the uh, influx of mobile application or web application, they all had to move because people were not allowed to come into the premises, right? So there was no way you could come back into the organization to work and you had to work remotely. Now, in this particular era, which we call as post-COVID era, you will all know and appreciate the fact that how much technology has helped in terms of helping the business to continue in spite of people not being allowed to come into the organization. So let's look at what is actually going on when we speak about this digital transformation and what are the challenges. The number one challenge for digital transformation or the road blocker is actually the cyber attacks. I mean, you, you look at the screen which I have put in front of you, we see about ransomware. Uh, we see issues with cyber insurance, uh, issues affecting productivity, phishing campaigns. These are all coming because now when uh, the process is becoming much simpler and it comes to the into our hands through our mobile device, the same, uh, same avenue is what the cyber attackers are using to trick the end users. Now think, look at the second one which I put across here, speaking about the uh, something which came from Zurich Insurance. You know, Zurich is the, one of the biggest insurance companies in the world. Here in this article, they are, Zurich chief is saying that it, they are not going to allow insurance on to cyber attacks. Just to give you a background. So in any organization, uh, what happens is you typically do a, a risk assessment. Now in the risk assessment, we will find out what are the gaps in terms of people, process, and technology. And then we fix those gaps, or at least try and fix those gaps. Now, in spite of fixing everything, all the gap you identified, you will come to a point where there are still some gaps 
which you cannot address. Now, this is known as residual risk. Typically, what the organizations do is they take a strategy of transferring the risk to a third party. That means they will take an insurance. Now, what this Zurich chief is saying that they are going to stop insuring against these kind of uh, cyber attacks, which is based on the residual risk because they are finding that it is costing them a lot of money and that is a reality which what you are going to see and what we are facing in this world. So what do you mean by being resilient and cyber resilient? Now, resiliency is a term which is very familiar to us again thanks to COVID because all of us have gone through the COVID area and we are all now back. That means it shows how resilient we are as humans in spite of going through a deadly uh, uh, pandemic, we have been able to uh, resume back our business, our children's education, our family lives, everything we are back. And this is all about being resilient. Now, this is exactly what I'm showing in that uh, in animation. Being resilient is like bouncing back. So being resilient or being cyber resilient, what it means is in spite of the fact that you will be under an attack, how can you continue your business in a resilient manner? So one thing I want to make it very clear, I am not saying that you will never be attacked. Every organization can or might be attacked or probably you have already been attacked. The point is how in the, while the attack is going on, how can we make sure that the impact of that attack can be reduced to the bare minimum so that you can run the business as usual. So let me try and address this particular point through uh, this three-dimensional chessboard. Now, if you look at any organization, there are the, the gems of the organizations are three. It is the data, and it is the application, and then comes the users. These are the three valuable assets or gems of any organization. Again, I'll repeat the data, the application, and the user or the employee. These are the three major aspects. If we are able to secure these three, then and monitor them and apply all the settings possible, then we should be able in a better manner to be cyber resilient. So let me dive into these points in a much more uh, detailed manner. So I'm going to speak about how make data security, application security, then identity and access management and security operations can help in terms of protecting or enabling cyber resilience with an underlying layer of artificial intelligence. So I will go through these points one by one to start with data security. So here I'm going to speak about what is the relevance of data security in terms of privacy and protection. Now, this is a framework which I typically look uh, into while speaking to any organizations on the, when I speak about data privacy and protection. The, these are the five WH questions which are very important. What are you protecting? So it includes that we need to discover the data, categorize them, monitor them and protect them. And then which type of data? Is it structured data or is it unstructured data? And then where is this data located? Is it in the cloud or is it on premises or off cloud? And then when do you want to protect it? Do you want to protect it while it is in use or while it is in transit or in motion? or is it at rest? And then who, who is using this data? Is it a application which is using this data or is it a user which is using this data or an identity? So these are the five WH questions which needs to go into before starting for any data protection or privacy framework. Now, when we speak about uh, protection, data protection, the first thing that comes into our mind is definitely encryption. Now, when we think about encryption, 
this is the traditional encryption which we are talking about in the traditional encryption there are mainly three fundamental problems if you look at it i mean here i am showing uh, an example of a 16 digit credit card number like you can see those 16 digits has been transformed by aes 256 bit encryption into something which is completely different now look at it what is the first problem you can identify the first issue is this the size of the data explodes it moves into something much 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 bigger and the size changes that is the first issue that means the moment you encrypt the data you would need more and more space to store the data the second issue is if you look over here there is no way you can decrypt partially decrypt it because there is no uh, something like a referential integrity that means it is not possible for you to decrypt the first four digits alone or the last four digits alone it is not possible that leads to the third problem if you want to use this decrypted data the only way you can use it is by 100% decrypting it back to the original data. These are the three fundamental problems when it comes to a traditional uh, encryption. So, and again, adding to it, key management. Key management is definitely a nightmare, as you know. Now, let's look at something known as a format preserving encryption. So, this is something patented by uh, us. Uh, in which uh, the format doesn't change. Let me, allow me to explain it furthermore. Here again, I'm taking an example of a credit card information and uh, some of the name, the first name, last name, some IDs, date of birth. Like what you can see over here, in a format preserving encryption, the format doesn't change. So it preserves the format. Now it can be for a number, it can be for a letter, or it can be for anything mixed. So here, this is just an example. This credit card information, when you do a format preserving encryption, it moves to this, but in an AES encryption, it moves to this. And if you look at the names, this is how it moves. So in a format preserving encryption, it moves to something with the same format, that means the same number of letters, everything the same, they retain the original format, whereas in uh, the traditional encryption, it doesn't do it. Now, this format preserving encryption, it's like I said, it is patented and it is based on AES. So it is based on the same AES advanced encryption standard to 256 bit encryption. And it is known as AES hyphen FFX. This is actually the uh, encryption which has been patented by uh, which what we use in our organization or uh, the company which I represent. So now why this is very important is because it preserves the format that means i want to go back to the three problems i mentioned before it doesn't change the size the size remains the same that means you don't need to have extra storage you do not need to rewrite the applications to change the input buffer any of those things and what is the second one we can decrypt partially the second and the third so we can reuse the data to run analytics. For example, if you look at the credit card information, the first four digits is what gives it out, whether it's a master or visa card. We can decrypt the first four digits alone and run analytics to find out whether it's a master card or a visa card. You don't need to decrypt the entire data. I'll come back to uh, um, give you more details and examples of this. So this is a field level end-to-end -end data protection and it, it's, a, it's known as format preserving encryption and this is an example which i wanted to show about so if you look over here this is how it looks like the name the ssns the credit card number street address customer id uh, details all these things everything can be changed or you can decide what you want to preserve in the original format so in this after one like you, what you can see the names have been completely changed but the format is preserved the SSNs has been changed, but the last four digits has been retained. Credit card has been changed, but the first six and the last four digits has been retained. Street address is completely changed and things like that. Now, let me try and show you how it works in an actual scenario. Now, this is an example where we are showing a 
onboarding a customer into a banking application. So like you can see, customer is logging from a web browser, uh, putting a new account application. It goes to the mainframe database, then associated departments are fraud detection, uh, customer service, uh, because they need to call the customer to probably verify certain things. We are running analytics and finally going to the credit card processing. So typically what happens is when the customer, let's say the customer's name is John Smith, and he logs in with his details, it goes into the mainframe database, it's sent everywhere into the uh, help desk, into the fraud detection, into the Hadoop analytics, and also to the credit card processing. But actually, if you look at it, the the two places where it needs the full information is one is over here when when it hits the uh, front end web server, and the second is over here where they need the full information for the processing. All these people, I mean, for fraud detection, running analytics, customer service, they don't need to know the entire piece of information. Now, what is the risk over here? Let's say somebody, some compromise happens over anywhere over here, then your full data is exposed. Let's see how it happens with format preserving encryption. If I apply format preserving encryption, so the application will go in. Once it hits the front end web server, then immediately it is actually the format preserving encryption kicks in. It will send the information like this. So whatever you can see, which is in green, has already been encrypted using FPE, format preserving encryption. And this is how it looks like. So just take an example of the customer service person. To the person, he will know the, the, the customer service or the help desk person will know the customer is John Smith, but he doesn't need to know the full 16 digit card information. So we'll only expose the first four digits and the last four digits. Now, what is the benefit over here? If a compromise happens at this point of time, it is still in an encrypted manner. And though the attacker might think that it is a actual data, but it is not actual data because the, he's only getting the 16 digits in which the first four and the last four are in the clear text. Remaining the middle uh, octet, is, it is completely in a format preserved encrypted manner. The same applies when it goes to fraud detection and Hadoop analytics. And the only place after which we need to, we need to give the entire thing in clear text is actually the credit card processing. This application through API can call a virtual appliance and do the decryption and present it back. So this is how it happens. So everywhere, if you look at it, the uh, we can either send it across in a completely encrypted manner and using API calls decrypted, or decide that, okay, to a particular application, I want to send it in this particular format. That means I will keep the, in this example, the name in clear text, but in the credit card or the card information, only the first four and the last four is in a clear text. Now, what are the use cases? There are amazing use cases around this. I mean, think about whatever you are having in your organization. I mean, we speak about big data analytics. Analytics is the fundamental, um, uh, now the, I will say, uh, the livelihood when it goes to securing more in business because you need to do, um, uh, do analytics to find out business intelligence, market intelligence, but then you don't want to compromise the data so you can look at. Now, the major place where this is actually happening is in the telecom environment where they're using something known as data monetization, where all our data, our mobile number, is used in terms of sending targeted advertisements, but then GDPR comes into picture where the information cannot be shared completely. But here is where telecoms are using it to uh, format preserve encrypt it and expose only the bare minimum or the minimal information which is needed for the third parties for sending this targeted uh, uh, advertisements. Then goes test data management. This is again an amazing solution for uh, TDM because in TDM typically customers use masking. But you know the, what's the problem in masking? Masking is a one way. It cannot be retrieved back to its original form. And if you run all your test application based on mask data and later try it in the production, those who are in the application development, you know that it never works. It, you you end up in huge issues. Here is where the format preserving encryption can play a major role. Going to data privacy compliance, it can be a major, majorly used in the compliance frameworks like GDPR or a PCI compliance. I mean, when it comes to PCI compliance, uh, the Carrefour chain across the world is a classic example. They're using our 
uh, uh, FP format preserving encryption. So the fun, the time you walk into a, a Carrefour chain and then uh, tap or swipe your credit card from that uh, uh, port machine it, itself, credit card machine itself, the entire data is format preserved encrypted. Then another major area is definitely the cloud. Think about you have been asked or because of the uh, digital transformation again, you need to probably move to the cloud. But here is where we can encrypt the data and put it on the cloud. Now, what is a you know what happens in a cloud provider, right? I mean, if you want to encrypt the data, you need to do encryption. And if you do a traditional encryption, the size will increase. If the size increases, you need more storage. More storage means you need to pay more money to the cloud provider. But using format preserving encryption, the size doesn't change. So we apply format preserving encryption and put it on the cloud. So you're get, going to get benefits of both the worlds. You're going to get the benefit of security. At the same time, you do not need to pay more to store it because it is, and the key is with you. So if a compromise happens in the cloud or uh, some US federal agency wants to grab the data, still your data will be in a secure manner because the key to decrypt it is with you. And then again, other areas of end-to-end -end payments and structured data files and emails. These are the various use cases. So this is the first point on how to do the data security part and protect your data while in use, while in motion, and while at rest. So I just want to stress on this point. I'm sure all of you are using VPNs and sort of database encryption. Now these two areas are only addressing two points. That means a VPN or SSL will help in terms of doing uh, uh, encrypting the data while in motion. And a database encryption will help the data while it is at rest. But what about the data while it is in use? For example, a help desk person, person can take a screenshot or use his mobile phone and take a picture. So while in use, how can you protect the data? And the answer is format preserving encryption. So it covers all the three states of data, which is data at rest, data in motion, and data in use. The second area I want to speak about is about the applications. Like I said, the, the second most precious gem in your organization is the applications which you're using. In digital transformation, everything is moving into application. It is, can be a, a web-based application, it can be a mobile application, but everything is at your fingertips where you can either make or break the business. So now how can we make sure that these applications are secured? Now, if you look at what is happening uh, in the current uh, organizations is, since 2010, the number of applications and their release frequency has increased. It has grown in an exponential manner. I mean, look at this diagram in terms of how it is going. So the now, if you look at these applications, IT always wants to launch these applications, either a new application or it is a new build for an application because some new features has been added. Now, who is the person who's slowing down the digital transformation? Obviously, it's always the security team because they say that no, you cannot release this into the uh, open without we checking it. So they will always have a uh, create, a, a, I mean, security team typically is called as a hurdle or you know, a pain in the neck sometimes, uh, uh, which is slowing down the digital transformation. But think about a scenario where you release an application which is buggy. That means with open doors where an attack can come in that can result in the entire organization's reputation, uh, 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 spoiling reputation as well as sometimes even losing money, big time manner. If it is a public uh, listed company, then you can imagine the uh, crash which can happen to the share value. So what can we do towards this? So here is where application security is very much needed and it should be early in the software development cycle. So I compare uh, application security or application development uh, similar to like a car manufacturing industry. Think about this, um, uh, companies like a, a Merck or BMW, let's say they, they are designing a new car. Now, how difficult it is for them to change the size of a bolt in the car when it is closer to the production. Isn't it easier for them to fix that or address that particular issue while they are still 
in the design phase. Same applies to application development. It is easier to fix, identify and fix an issue while the application during the application development phase rather than moving into the operations. So we call uh, that is why we always say it is a it is needed to shift left in the application development life cycle or the software development life cycle or SDLC. So here is where we need to make sure that application security is embedded earlier in the software development life cycle. So we are talking about the complete integration, automation and agility. So if you look at a, a typical SDLC, so here is where we are talking about shifting security towards the left. So rather than thinking about security by doing a penetration testing in the production or in the staging, why don't we look over here itself? So this is where we have the, the second point of application security of protecting applications where we start from the development phase. That means from the time a developer is coding the application in his ID environment or putting it into the core repository or while running unit test or integration testing or while uh, using some open source libraries that also needs to be tested or and then testing it again in the dynamic stage where it is actually in the staging stage before it goes into the production. So we address all these points. So it is very important for you to understand this terminology. So SAS stands for Static Application Security Testing. This is where we speak about uh, the uh, testing the application in the development phase. SES stands for Software Composition Analysis. This is where we look at the open source libraries. For those who are development houses, you know that majority of the application modules right now are copy pasted from the open source. But these open source are good. However, they are not security tested, probably quality tested, but not tested from a cybersecurity perspective. That is why software composition analysis is very important. And then comes dynamic application security testing where we test it in after compilation to see how to before in the, st in the staging environment. And obviously, it has to be integrated with the SecOps, which I'm going to speak about later, but monitoring it in real time is also very important. So just to show, uh, again, go through the application development lifecycle. So the developer is coding. He will have an ID environment like an Eclipse, posting it into the code repository, build server, the continuous integration server. Then we have the staging server, the pre-production, and then it goes back into if there are bugs or something it goes back into the goes back again and if it clears all the testing is when it goes to the production so now where does application security needs to plug in first one it has to be starting from here it has to be part of the developer's id environment where developer gets a recommendation from a security perspective for example he's uh, uh, sql injection vulnerability something which can result is like is that you're not do, doing any input validation. So if the developer is typing something like that, a recommendation should pop up saying that this is a uh, this can result in SQL injection vulnerability. <coughs> Excuse me. This is where again a cultural change is needed when it comes to the developers community because they are not security savvy. They are more into making sure that the application looks better, things like that, more functionalities. And here is where the security assistant or giving recommendations plays a major role. Then comes whenever the developers post it onto a code repository or a build server, the automation should trigger and there should be a scanning. It can be a module by module or unit by unit or just before the compiling the entire application. It can be hundreds or thousands or millions of lines in the source code, doesn't matter. Matter if the tool should be able to test it. Then comes the dynamic testing side when it is posted onto the staging server. Obviously, if there is any issue, it will go back again to the developer to fix it. And then once finally it comes into the production, while running on the production, you need to have a real time. We call it a runtime application self-protection. This is again another component, a very important component of a uh, AppSec tool. And then finally feeding into the SIM or the SOC so that it, it, it can actually be monitored. Now, 
when an app set comes into an environment, it has to integrate with whatever IT investments you have already done. As IT, you might have gone ahead for digital transformation purpose for various things. Now, when you uh, get into an application security or an AppSec program, you should make sure that the AppSec program can integrate with all the things. I mean, it can be from a uh, bug tracking perspective, like a Bugzilla, or an ID platform, like an Eclipse or a Visual Studio, or from a GitHub perspective, or from a Bitbucket, uh, Bitbucket perspective, anything like that, it should be. And it should also integrate with the quality testing tools like an ALM of team and open source tools like Sonatype, uh, anything like that. We speak about uh, Jenkins, it needs to integrate. So this is how you protect your IT investment and make sure that application security integrates and it can completely automate it. So this is where the biggest uh, value add comes from an application security. So that's about the second portion which I wanted to speak about this application. The third one is the users. Here is where I want to speak about <clears throat> identity and access management. Now, when we speak about users or identity and access management, the it also goes into not only users, it moves into user as a user and users various identities within the organization and the services what they use. Now, you know these three things we speak about, people, process, and technology. And as you know, the weakest link in this is people. So that is why the protecting the people or the identity is, uh, user identity is very, very important. And, I'm sorry, to make sure that, <clears throat> to make sure that this users are protected. So work is an activity, not a place. I'm sure you'll all agree with me on this. So this is where we, and especially because of the post-COVID era, everything has changed. So the who, the where, and the what of access has changed dramatically. And this is actually putting the business to the risk. So it is very important for you to identify uh, who is the user, not just who is the user, where is he accessing from? Is he accessing this from a uh, place which is place or country which is not allowed, which is not allowed uh, to, to be accessed from? And what is he accessing? Is he just accessing a specific application, or is he using getting into an application and trying to go somewhere else? Because, like what you can see over here, the people can access it from a coffee shop, can from a workplace, or from home. I mean, that is the reality of what we are seeing now. So we can do a complete identity lifecycle management, and this is very important to be done. So when you uh, when you make sure an employee is onboarded into your company, or a user or a customer is onboarded to your for using your application, it is very important to go through all the steps of provisioning, authenticating, authorization. Also, there should be self service because you cannot you cannot always uh, put the task of fixing the issue onto the help desk, uh, password management, and governing the access. I mean, we need to also audit it to say that okay, is the access correct? Is it going? Is if they are accessing all the correct uh, applications uh, and uh, the correct level of authorizations? And then finally, when the employee is leaving the organization or the customer is uh, stopping the services, deprovisioning the particular user. So the complete identity management life cycle, the same way we speak about software development life cycle, identity management life cycle is very important. And believe me or not, I've seen some organizations where, uh, government organizations where, and who's having very confidential uh, information, the employees have left the organization, but still they have VPN access into the previous organization. So think about the scenario like that. Think about a scenario where one of your employees um, left in a very bad manner and you forgot to remove his access, VPN access. Then after leaving the organization, he can still come back into the organization through VPN and do whatever he needs. And isn't it a major security risk? And this is actually causing, that is why managing the identity is very important. That's why I said the third important piece is actually the user or the identity. And according to Gartner, when we look at it, 
what are the three different pillars of identity and access management it is access management identity governance and privilege access management now access management is all about the authorization part uh, iga or governance is all about making sure that an audit is being done to make sure that the correct people have been given the correct access at the correct time to the correct asset and privilege access management is where we look into the power users the people with more power in the organization like the database administrators or the active directory administrators the firewall administrators uh, these kind of people because when an attacker gets in an organization they try and to compromise the uh, these kind of users so that they know that they have high, higher privileges to go around in the organization and so exploiting or compromising their account will give them more value more return on investment so these are the three areas of uh, identity and access management which is very relevant to any organization to make sure that you actually protect the end user identity so having said these four different areas of data application and user identity the fourth area which is very important is the security operations it's like an umbrella over everything now the security operations is obviously going to have a lot of artificial intelligence also built in because of which all the three different areas of data applications and identity feeds into the tech ops or the security operations area now what is a secops now secops like you know it stands for security operations it is like a real time monitoring but it is much beyond that not to make it clear to you i just wanted to put across the mission of a secops uh this is again based on a book uh, called time based security so in um typically in any organization the ciso's uh objective will be to make sure the protection time is more than the exposure time let me explain that. so the idea is if you have uh, if you have put uh, all the three parameters the people parameter the process parameter and the technology parameter on the protection time examples like uh, firewalls antivirus and all and you have uh, put these then that let's say a compromise happens but if the time of protection exceeds the time of compromise or exposure time then you are still safe so even if a compromise happens do you have all the mechanisms in place to protect then even if the exposure happens the exposure time is going to be smaller compared to the protection time let me explain that more by telling what is exposure time See, the exposure time is nothing other than a sum of time to detect and time to respond remember what i said in the beginning i am not saying that you will never be attacked you will be attacked but the point remains in how fast can you detect that you have been under attack and how fast you can respond to it these two parameters contribute towards exposure time so the faster the time to detect and the faster the time to respond means lower exposure time then if you have if you lower that exposure time and you already have a set parameter on protection time because you cannot increase your protection time or protection parameter beyond a particular value because it is based on the uh, how smart your people are in terms of identifying a phishing attack for example and uh, the processes are and the technology like firewalls and antivirus and all so that is a set time now the exposure time you can reduce by making sure the time to detect and time to respond is reduced now let's look into what are the various parameters which goes under that so reduced exposure time if you want to reduce the detection detection time you need to have end to end visibility you need to apply layered analytics layered analytics is a, a wonderful term because when you speak about analytics it is the underlying technologies include Uh, again uh, machine learning that to two types it has got supervised and unsupervised machine learning so that is very important and uh, then you need to have external threat intelligence coming in but what you cannot just depend upon 
the intelligence which is there you're gathering from your organization you need to know what is happening to uh, organizations or in your own industry vertical across the world for example <clears throat> if you're into oil and gas you probably need to know what is happening across the world for oil and gas customers or utility customers if you are into the banking area you need to know are there any targeted attacks happening uh, for the banking industry across the world <coughs> excuse me so this is why it is very important to have the entire um, uh, the different parameters working together speaking about layered analytics this is what i wanted to mention a little more into detail layered analytics can also that is that is the area where we used to reduce the time to detect and which contributes towards the automation part automation helps in terms of uh, responding faster or reducing the time to respond when you look into layered analytics there is a uh, uh, unsupervised machine learning there is supervised machine learning there is big data analytics real time correlation and threat intelligence so when somebody speaks to you about analytics, these are the five different areas you need to look into. Excuse me again. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so machine learning, I mean, you, I'm sure you heard about the terminology of machine learning. Machine learning is also two types, supervised and unsupervised. Supervised machine learning means it is based on rules. It is just like you telling the machine to say that Tell me when you see so and so signature. Tell me when you see so and so parameter. This is what it means actually by. So in, in supervised machine learning, it is all about teaching the machine what to detect. Otherwise it cannot detect. Otherwise the machine is just dumb. It was not able to find out what you need. But in unsupervised machine learning, it is based on data models. You do not need to teach the machine what to detect or what to alert on. It is based on the uh, data model which it has. For example, I mean, it, it is completely based on statistical analysis. Now, what is the difference? Um, a supervised machine learning tool is like a, a signature-based antivirus. It will be productive from day one. But an unsupervised machine learning which is based on a statistical analysis algorithm needs time to create a benchmark or create a normal to find out what is a normal behavior. So it will typically take at least 30 days before which, uh, and it needs that much time to create a benchmark and then give the uh, results. So that is a difference between these two. And then we go to real time correlation, which has to work hand in hand. Now, if you look at, uh, what, interestingly, what Gartner predicts on OT, operational technology environment is, it can be weaponized to do the compromise. And if you look into what is a, a success criteria in terms of having an effective uh, defense against these cyber attackers, in an, especially in an OT area or a telecom area, OT means operation technology, the type of technology which you see being used in utilities, uh, in airports where uh, with a click of a button on a, or a, on, a, on a mobile phone or a laptop, you can convert that into a physical action. An example is like opening the shutter of a dam or stepping up the voltage in a utility company, increasing the water pressure in the pipe. All these things are examples of a uh, SCADA kind of uh, applications uh, running in OT environment. The success criteria are five steps. One is in this type of areas, you will not be, or a telecom area, you will not be allowed to install agents onto these devices. Then the logs which are coming needs to flow uh, in a unidirectional manner because uh, of which only uh, uh, TCP IP uh, protocols typically will not work. It will, only UDP will work. It needs to allow multi-tenancy to lower the TCO and obviously integrations with other technologies. I'm just rushing through because of the shortage of time. Uh, I'll, this is again a, a use case from a company called Dubai Electricity and Water Authority in Dubai where they tested uh, and the reason why they went ahead with uh, the technology which we represent. I just wanted to show you this because this is the typical snapshot from, a, uh, from the mobile application where I can see that this is my electricity and water consumption and I can compare it against 
my neighbors or my locality and also i'll get some uh, automated uh, text messages if my normal changes from whatever i have been using or suddenly there is a surge in terms of the water or electricity usage now this has been possible specifically because of uh, using our uh, technology purely because you think about this critical infrastructure this electricity and water they fall under the critical infrastructure and in this particular example which i showed about in terms of diva dubai electricity and water authority they are monitoring the complete desalination process so in dubai uh, we get water by converting sea water into drinking water that entire process is monitored by uh, the sim technology using our secops uh, solution so this is again just an example of how the underlying uh, uh, data application and identity and access management integrates with the security operations. So let me conclude. These are the areas which I, I spoke about. The three important areas for any organization to be cyber resilient is to make sure that you protect your data, your application and user identity. And how do you do it is by an overarching umbrella of security operations. Just to introduce the technologies which uh, we represent in this area, in data security, we have a solution called Voltage. In application security, we have a solution called Fortify. In identity and access management, the solution is NetIQ. And in security operations, uh, and uh, is a technology called ArcSight. And when it comes to artificial intelligence, we have a technology called Intercept. So these are the various technologies which we represent as an organization. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. And thank you very much for your time. And I'll be more than happy to address any of the queries you have uh, uh, from in any of the topics I mentioned. Thank you again. Have a nice day. Thank you very much, Arun. Um, as you can see, Arun was is present, um, although he does have an audio issue, so he can't hear me. Um, but I just want to thank Arun for um, being here for us and uh, the fact that he recorded the session despite having a, quite a bit of the flu, and he was able to send us the um, recording. Um, we go, will jump now immediately to the next um, uh, keynote session, um, so you can leave this um, session and then um, join the second keynote session on the main stage. Thank you very much.